others among you. Jesus warned about being deceived. Jesus warned about those who would be saying, I am he. Jesus warned about those who would say the Messiah is out or the Messiah is in. He says, don't run after him. Paul warns about the false teachers. Paul warns about those who will do signs and wonders. He warns about the man of lawlessness. He warns about all those different ways that the mystery of lawlessness is now at work in our world. And he says, don't be deceived. Peter's picking up on that theme and Peter's running with it. Uh, so that his readers also might have an understanding of what is coming on those days. In fact, Peter draws a sharp contrast in this letter between those who remember the truth and live accordingly and those who forget the truth and live destructively. You'll notice if you read through the entire letter the number of times he says, don't forget. The number of times we just read a minute ago where in verse 5 in chapter 3, those who are scoffing, the Bible says, they deliberately forget. In other words, they purposefully ignore truth that is in Scripture. <laughs> so one idea that Peter has in his permeating this, this, this letter is the idea of godly living. And the other one is maintaining the truth that is going to see us through to the end. And the final chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3, places an exclamation point. On the exhortation that Peter gives and emphasizes the mind as the battleground where the fight for the final days will occur. The mind. In chapter 3, verse 3, he says, above all, you must understand. He's emphasizing the mind. So I'm going to give you three ideas that he says about the mind that helps you and I prepare for those final days. Number one, steady your mind to understand the argument. A lot of the arguments that we're hearing when you hear people trying to justify unrighteous behavior, a lot of the arguments and the information that's provided doesn't come from a place of truth. It doesn't come from a place of righteousness. It doesn't come from a place that is, a, 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 it doesn't even come from a place of common sense. Man. It's simply thrown out there, and typically there is an emotion attached to it. You don't want someone to feel bad. So we're going to allow their behavior to continue. You've seen it with the, the swimmer from the University of Pennsylvania and all the backlash that has happened uh, over that scenario. And what it comes down to is, is nobody wanted to make that person feel bad for a decision that that person made. And even if it excludes others from being able to demonstrate their ability and their hard work, this emotional drive fueled that argument. And it's the same way with every issue that we face that leads us away from the truth of Scripture. And so Peter is emphasizing, make sure you understand. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. In 2 Thessalonians, we read that Paul encouraged his readers, don't be deceived. And we talked about how when you walk into the show of an illusionist, one of the, the precepts of being able to enjoy that show is to set aside your disbelief. You know the things you see on stage aren't real, but to enjoy the show, you set aside that disbelief. Paul says, don't let that happen in your life. When you see something that doesn't match the truth of Scripture, you cannot follow it, you cannot entertain it, you cannot let it into your mind or into your heart. Paul also says not to be so easily unsettled or alarmed by those things that you hear. He was speaking specifically of those that were teaching that the day of the Lord had already come. We also know that Paul dealt with those who had thought that if you weren't alive when Christ came back, you missed out on the, the second coming altogether. We also know that Paul had to deal with those who were teaching that there is no resurrection. We know those ideas were coming in Paul's day. We know those ideas were coming in Peter's day. And so there's an emphasis to steady your mind, not to be overcome with emotion because you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, but to steady your mind to understand the arguments. Verse 3 says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing. And we typically skip to verse 4. That then they will say, where is the coming he promised? The scoffing, though, is not a curiosity about where the Lord is. 
They're not questioning what's taking him so long. They're questioning the reality of it all together. They're not questioning where is he. They're scoffing at the idea that he's coming back at all. The motivation for their scoffing wasn't curiosity. The motivation for their scoffing was iniquity. Because most people skip over the final words of verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing. And look at that next phrase. And following their own evil desires. Steady your mind to understand the argument. Anything, any person, any organization that wants to throw out some idea that goes against Scripture is doing so for an unrighteous reason. When we see what Peter writes there in verse 3, we realize this is a, the last example of a long line of things that he has written starting in chapter 2, verse 1. But there will also be false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And Peter goes through and outlines their specific false doctrines and specific teachings that they were offering. Chapter 2, verse 1. Just as there will be also false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. So Peter is saying that these false teachers are not coming in from the outside. These are not people who are assaulting the church with destructive ideas. These are people who have a portion or at least have a connection with the community of faith. And they're allowing these ideas to come up from within so that people who have a belief in Jesus Christ are being led astray. And we see that all over our nation as well. We see people who have a connection to a church. It may be a loose connection. But at some point in time, you will see them, you will hear them make reference to their faith, make reference to their belief, and then you hear them spout some idea that may go as far as what Peter is suggesting here. It's a destructive heresy that denies the Lord who bought them. Verse 2 in chapter 2. Many will follow their depraved conduct. And will bring the way of truth into disrepute. These are people who are involved in the community of faith. And yet they're allowing their behavior to walk off the straight and narrow path. And they're allowing their behavior to bring a bad reputation to the community of Christ. All because of these teachings that they are introducing. Skip down to chapter 2 verse 10. This is especially true. Of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh. Like Esau was driven by the hunger in his belly. He gave away his birthright. So there are those in Peter's day. And there are those in our day. Who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh. And then the last one there in verse uh, chapter 2 verse 10. Is they also despise authority. Now Peter adds one more at the end of chapter 3. Chapter 3 verse 16. He says that ignorant and unstable people distort the scriptures to their own destruction. Depraved heresies that deny the Lord, deny the sovereignty, deny the resurrection, deny the power, deny the authority of the Lord. Depraved conduct that comes from a darkened heart. Corrupt desires that are, are the, the outpouring of the flesh. They despise authority. Nobody can tell them what to do. Nobody can tell them what is right and wrong. And they distort the scripture for their purpose. Paul warned the Ephesian elders on the day that he was leading them that wolves and sheep clothing would rise up from among their ranks and destroy what had been established. Steady your mind to understand the arguments. Don't be carried away by emotion. Don't be carried away by what feels good. Don't be carried away by gratification. Steady your mind to understand the argument. Because everyone who brings a doctrine that goes against what is written in Scripture does so for one of two purposes. Number one, they want to exercise authority over you. They want to do something to lead you along or lead you astray. Chapter 2, verse 3, Peter says, In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. They will exploit you with fabricated stories. Chapter 2, verse 18. 
For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. There are a lot of similarities in what Peter has to say and what the writer of Hebrews has to say about those who taste of the heavenly gift and then turn their back on it and the destruction that awaits them. They want to exercise authority. Chapter 3, verse 18, verse 17. Since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless, the error of the lawless, and fall from your secure position. Every time you hear something, hear somebody, some organization, some person, some leader speak against something that is taught in Scripture, they do so to exercise authority over you. The other reason is they do so to exercise iniquity, just to be able to justify their sin, just to be able to make it sure that you can't confront them, you can't correct them. Chapter 3, verse 3, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They're not curious about his coming. They simply want justification to do as they please. Be on guard. Peter says in his first letter, gird up your loins, be prepared, steady your mind, not swayed by emotional appeal, but standing firm on the truth. Steady your mind to understand the arguments that are going to come from those who scoff in the last days. Number two, he says, strengthen your mind through what has been written. Strengthen your mind through what has been written. You see, the end is going to be characterized by deception. Jesus said that. Paul said that. Peter said that. And so they all three agree on the need to decipher deception and battle against it through what has been written. In this letter, Peter mentions three different sources of authority that you and I can trust. The first one is found in chapter 1, verse 20. Paul says, Peter says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through human, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the first source of information is the prophets, those things that are written in the Old Testament. Those things that were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, where people were able to write them down. The prophets are a source of information that Peter returns to on a number of occasions. He also lists... Another group in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter includes himself in that group. Peter remembers the words of John. Peter remembers those who traveled with Jesus. Peter remembers all those who have spent the remainder of their days teaching and preaching and leading the church. And he wants people to remember that they speak with authority because they heard it straight from the Lord himself. And the third source of authority that Peter addresses or identifies Stop. is actually the Apostle Paul. Chapter 3, verse 15. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other, the other scriptures to their own destruction. So yes, Peter knew Paul. We know that from Galatians. They had that run in where Paul had to confront him. Peter was familiar with Paul's writings. The church that Peter is writing this letter to was familiar with Paul's writings. They all had this, uh, this source of information, and Paul, Peter uh, allows all of those, the prophets, the apostles, and Paul, to be sources of authority through which people can strengthen their mind. Peter was an apostle. 
And so was Paul, although he was born out of due time, according to his own words. Peter was an eyewitness. Chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For we did not cleverly devise stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter himself was an eyewitness. On the other hand, Paul was blinded before he could start his ministry. Peter was a fisherman. Paul was a Pharisee. Peter knew the stories of Scripture. Paul knew the law of the Lord. But together they give us authority on which we can stand. Together their words come and they form a foundation on which we can face our future. Together they come together with the truth of Scripture. They allow us to strengthen our minds by what we say. And even Peter says that Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. But they're no less authoritative. And as he emphasized the need for godly living, he returns to the Old Testament. Chapter 1, verse 3. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world Caused by evil desires. Chapter 2 verse 4. For God did not spare the angels when they sinned. But sent them to hell. Putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world. When he brought the flood on its ungodly people. But protected Noah as a preacher of righteousness and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. And this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Strengthen your mind through what is written. And something that has been written is that all of the wickedness that we see and all the unrighteousness in our world is not going uncontested. It's not going. God is simply patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. His patience means salvation. But we can stand assured that people who are acting like this are not getting away with their behavior. Amen. A judgment day will come. Peter refers to that several different times. There in chapter 2, verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly, how to rescue the godly from trials, how to hold the righteous for punishment on the day. Chapter 3, verse 6. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. <coughs> being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Strengthen your mind by what has been written. A judgment day is coming. Yeah. We have what we need to live a godly life because of those who have written to us, the prophets, the Old Testament, the apostles, Peter included, and even the apostle Paul, who is an apostle born out of due time. Everything they have written is for our benefit and to strengthen us in these last days. And finally, Peter says, to set your mind on what is to come. To set your mind on what is to come. In, these, in this last chapter, three different times, Peter says something about things that we are looking forward to. We're looking forward to what God has in store for us. Chapter 12, or chapter 3, verse 12. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed. It's coming. Verse 13. 
But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And then verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Things to which we are looking forward. But we want to make sure that we're looking forward from the right position. <laughs> Peter's whole emphasis is on those who are part of the body of Christ, those who represent the community of faith, those who come to worship, those who are participating in that family of God, and yet their heart is not right with God, and yet they're following some untruths, and they're following some false <laughs> doctrines. And Peter says God is patient so that you have time to get right before it returns. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 7. By that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire and being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day or like a watch in the night. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Now, we can transfer that and say he's patient with the world. We know that Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians that, that God is restraining the man of lawlessness in order that grace might continue for an extended period of time. But one day that restraint is removed and that man will be revealed and then you see what destruction will really look like. That's right. Mm. But right now everything is reserved. Everything is restrained. Instead, he is patient with you. <coughs> Not with your neighbor. Although he is patient with that person as well. Not with the person across the world, although he is patient with that. That's not Peter's point. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We've heard that before as well. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth... And everything done in it will be laid bare. Another phrase that perhaps people overlook when reading the words of Peter. We understand that the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth is going to be made new. But do you catch the words that he used there? He says that everything in it, everything done in it will be laid bare. If Christ returned right now, would you be ready? If everything that was in your heart at this moment was laid bare, was exposed, was set forth for the world to see, would you be ready for his return? Peter is convinced there are some reading his letters that are not ready for that day. And while they may be scoffing and they want to get by with their own desires, he says, the Lord is not slow. He is patient with you. And so as we set our mind on what is to come, we want to make sure that we're standing in the right spot. Verse 12, verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? It goes beyond that, the idea of everything's going to burn. It goes beyond the idea that everything that we see now will be made new. It goes to the idea that we represent something greater. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. And that's a phrase that no one really knows the answer to. How in the world do we speed the day of God? Some people, the, the, best, the best explanation is that God is waiting for the gospel to get to the ends of the earth. And when the gospel gets to the ends of the earth, then the return will happen. And so we hasten its coming, we speed its coming by taking the gospel to the end of the earth. And that's about the only explanation that's ever given about what Peter has to say about speeding its coming. Some have suggested he's talking about allowing that day of the Lord, allowing that, that sense of expectation, that sense of anticipation to um, well up in your heart so that you are excited about that. And you're looking forward to the day that that comes. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. If you don't like righteousness on earth, why in the world would you want an eternity mm. of righteousness? 
That's right. Amen. But those whose hearts have been changed, that's what they desire. Those who are standing in the right spot, that's what they want to see. A new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Spotless and blameless. Back to that theme of godly living. Back to that theme of righteous living. Looking forward to the day, what kind of people ought to be? Holy and godly lives. Spotless and blameless. But Peter includes one more phrase that kind of has an attachment to what he said in verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make sure or make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Only you can answer the question of whether or not you're at peace with God right now. Only you can answer the question as to whether or not your heart is in that right spot. Paul says that it's through Christ that we have peace with God. It's through his sacrifice that we have peace with God. It's through his coming and covering our sins with his blood, washing them away and making us clean. That's how we find peace with him. As you set your mind on what's to come, you have to make sure that your heart is at peace with God. Because you would not want him to appear. And you have some unsettled matter resting on your heart that you were going to get to one day. Things kept interrupting you. You wanted to give yourself a little more time. You had that spirit of procrastination thinking that there was no termination date on the Lord's coming. The Lord's not slow concerning his promise. He is patient towards you. We know his patience means salvation. So as you look forward to that, spotless, blameless, at peace with him. As we sing our invitation, you have an opportunity to take advantage of the words that Peter understood. He was an unschooled, ordinary man. Paul was a Pharisee, educated beyond measure, top of his class. Peter was an unschooled, ordinary man, and yet his words carry the same authority as the prophets and Paul. And he calls you to be at peace with the Lord. Don't let that day get here and you think, I should have taken care of this earlier. We've been forewarned. That's how he ends this. Verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you might not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to him be glory, now and forevermore. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, your grace is sufficient. And Father, your patience is unexplainable. We know that Paul encouraged us to pray that when we pray, there's a peace that passes all understanding that will guard our hearts and minds. But Lord, when we think about your Patience. We have to use that same concept because we know that we are sinners. And we wonder, as the psalmist did, what is man that you consider? Him? God, how is it you're patient with us? Peter reveals it. You desire that no one should perish, but that all should come to repent. So, Father, as we look forward to your coming and the return of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do want to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with you. So, Father, I pray right now, if there's anyone in this room whose heart is not at peace with you, that, Father, you would bring conviction and restoration and redemption and reconciliation so they could leave this room whole, knowing that you have accepted them, that you have declared peace to you. Use this time for your glory and be glorified now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?